Oh, welcome. Hi, y'all. How you doing? Welcome to Wednesday night. Good to see the audience. We have a celebrity in here, a Celestian. We have an official Celestian here in the front. In the front. Um, we have a real Celestian right here. Uh, I'm an honorary Celestian. Um, yes, first of all, I just want to say welcome to Maggie's. If it's your first time here, welcome to our, our space. It's a civic and political gathering and event space here at Six in the Valencia. If you ordered some food or you're drinking wine, you're supporting a nonprofit restaurant run by an organization called Farming Hope. They hire and train formerly homeless, formerly incarcerated individuals exclusively. The kitchen placed them in a full time employment. It's all training and service kitchen. We're really proud to be partnering with them. Um, Dylan and Lisa are at the front, so thank you to them for serving you all. I want to thank Ram and Precious from our team over there. Precious is yes. our director of programming. Thank you for the vaccine card. Thank you for being vaccinated. Uh, and I think Tomas and Ram are running the Zoom. And to all of you tuning in on Zoom, thank you as well. We love and appreciate you, even though you're not here in person. You're here in spirit, so thank you. Um, so honored about tonight's event. I'm obviously not going to, I'm going to let, I think Derek, this is your show, so I'm going to let you um, be, uh, you know, it's our show. But I just have to say, the collective juju on this stage is very powerful. Yeah. This is a good stage. This is a very good stage right here uh, with all of the work of these four people. And I just want to say how humbled and honored I am to have you here uh, in this space. Um, and so thank you. Really, really thank you for taking time. I'm so excited to listen and hear what you all talk about tonight. Very important topic. Um, and I just want to say thank you all very much as well for showing up and being here and keeping this dream alive of mine. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand this uh, mic back over to you, Derek. So thanks so much. Good. Thanks, man. Let's give Ben another hand. I'm going to pass it to Dr. Davis and to pass it back. All right. Well, I just want to say again, thank you to Manny and to Manny and the team for opening up. Can we give another one? And I'm going to kick it back to Derek, but I think what is really amazing is that we're I'm sitting here I was like I don't know when I get to say I'm a native I guess never I've only been here almost 30 years but these are like two blue born and raised San Franciscans on the stage here and Derek was talking about like the work that he was doing with Latifa and with Roberto and was talking about what he wanted to, to do something with them. And I said, they are icons, right? They are legends in San Francisco. They represent so much. And yet each one of these three has a different path to what that success has been. And as we think about online learning, or as they're calling it, um, un, what is it, unfinished learning, all of these different names that we're talking about what education is today, like the learning and the education that they have is not necessarily from a textbook or a classroom. They all come from and have been to USF and have added to the knowledge that they have. But there is something special about their path and their journey that really can help folks who are kind of like, what is it? What is success? What, is, what does it look like to be in a place where you can give back to people? And I think that they represent that. And so, you know, Derek's gonna talk a little bit about the McCarthy Center and his role. And then I've asked them each to just introduce themselves and say what school, high school is like. Because again, we think about when does learning start and what kind of student are you? And if you're really great in school, that means that you're gonna be amazing when you get out of school. But what about if you're not in love with school? What if you're not like a book person in the beginning? Like for me, I went to state and it wasn't until like my third year of college that I was like, oh, that's history. Like I'm interested in that history, not the stuff that I had all the other years before. And so what does it look like when learning actually clicks on for you? So we are fortunate to have the mayor of the mission with us tonight, Roberto. I never know whether to call her the queen of Fillmore or the genius of San Francisco, but <laughs> Let's see for assignment. Um, I, I, I don't know if I should say this. I give Derek a hard time because he is he is like 
the Prince of Peace, right? Like he is, I say to him, I was like, you're, I don't know, like you just go home and sit on the couch and just drink beer and like cry because you are so amazing and polite and kind and like nothing bothers you in person. And so I just want to recognize and respect Derek's leadership, his communication, and his passion for community. So thank you, Derek, for letting me be here. Dr. Davis, let's do Dr. Davis. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You have to do I forgot, too. I know we already gave a little shout out. But, you know, president of the Board of Supervisors. President Shimon Walter. And this is amazing just looking at this, looking at this powerhouse. I know you all are looking this way, but I'm looking this way. Yeah. And I am blown away by the energy, the excitement. Everyone that has came out today, I'm looking at mentors like Hydra Mendoza, oh my, my girl, oh my man, you know, Bill Cartwright, you know, NBA legend over there with the USF, and Deborah, Linda, I mean, Josh, I mean, there you go, look, Dr. Stank, you know, got to give respect, hold it down. Uh, but this, this is an amazing opportunity. We have so many folks here coming together, uh, sharing space with us all, and as Dr. Davis touched on, you know, we're natives, you know, born and raised right here, grew up in the Mo, grew up in the West Condition. And um, it's, it's incredible because I, I have the opportunity now to lead the center, the Leo T. McCarthy Center at the University of San Francisco. So, and, and for me, it, it's incredible just growing up in the West Condition and now, you know, running the center. And for us at the center, our main goal is to prepare students for a successful life in public service. So whether they want to become an educator, whether they want to become a politician, um, whatever the case may be, we help them you know, get prepared for a life in public service. And myself, I've been doing this for, I'm not going to date myself or I say my age, but a little over 20 years, I've been crushing it and just taking things to the next level. And uh, definitely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And, and for myself, it's been incredible because I, you know, like I said, grew up in the Mo, went to Watts for high school. Uh, go, go Eagles, go Eagles, go Eagles in the house. But you know what it was, you know it, exactly. And, and it was incredible because I, I look back at that opportunity where I was fortunate enough to graduate high school. Unfortunately, a lot of my friends that grew up with in the Mo weren't that lucky. You know, a lot of my friends are either dead in jail or wandering the street aimlessly. So, when I had the opportunity to finish high school, um, college was, was not on my radar. No one in my family went to college. So the goal was to just finish high school. And in high school, my days of high school, it was all good. It was fun. I had a nice car. I had a school or old school. Uh, uh, it was a 1971 uh, Chevy Nose. It was all white, blue stripes. You know, I was doing my thing. I was, making, I was still the same one, same person now. but taking things to the next level back then, and just really working hard, but not necessarily striving to go to college or anything like that. The goal was just to get out of school, whether it's a at least a 2.0 to get out of school. So um, I, I finished up high school, graduated, I think I had like a 2.7. And then I just started working at the Boys and Girls Club of San Francisco, uh, running programs there with young people. Um, after a few years of doing that, I was inspired to go to school, uh, which I'll talk a little more about that a little later. Uh, went to City College, crushed it at City, uh, National Dean's List two years in a row. Derek is uh, always crushing. Oh, yeah, always. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 uh, but had an amazing opportunity there at City. I uh, got connected with great mentors that helped guide me uh, to where I am today. Uh, but finished up City College, graduated there, valedictorian, commencement speaker, transferred to UC Berkeley, and absolutely crushed it at Cal. Uh, and then continue to working in junction with community, uplift community, uh, left the Boys and Girls Club, went to Juvenile Probation Department, worked there for several years, uh, then had an opportunity to take advantage of a Coral Fellowship yeah. Program, which I absolutely, as you all know, pressed it, <laughs> uh, at Coral, it was an amazing experience where I took a helicopter approach sampling various sectors. Uh, that being said, at the end of that time, I had the opportunity to work back with the city um, work on the Mayor Ed Lee, uh, and Senior Advisor, hi, my girl, we work in hand in hand together, and uh, had the opportunity to lead the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services, and I was the Mayor's eyes and ears throughout the city, um, working with great folks. You weren't supposed to tell them all yet. You were supposed to just do the first <laughs> Oh, my bad. And as you guys know, I love to talk. So I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a 
I'm a boss. We got a little time more. Uh, but thanks again, Dr. Davis. Give it up for G. Brown. <laughs> thing that I was like really wanting to focus on is that idea of you didn't go straight to college no. right that that wasn't your path but you were still crushing it with that all I remember is the blue stripe like hey white yeah, blue yeah, stripe yeah. but same thing like Latifah right a different path a different journey share more about like that journey for you up until you know what was that process like did you love school because you were doing big things at a young age, you were running centers. Well, for the folks who are from USF, and if my professor is watching, I will turn it in, I promise. Friday night. I'm in grad school right now. Ooh. If you're born and raised in San Francisco, probably like most other cities, you set trip. I don't care if it's violent or non-violent. It's a benevolent set trip. I'm from the Western edition. I'm from Fillmore. And now that I'm a Don, it's like, you know, I just, I'm like USF on the bar. I'm like trying to what the sign is. Because it's my home. It's a, a pedagogical home for me now. Um, and just briefly, I did not crush it in elementary, middle, high school, undergrad. I'm currently not crushing it and take the village. And, yeah. and I'm not going to brush it, but I am going to be an amazing student. And I'm going to take and learn and sit at the stools of folks who have studied and studied and studied. I'm not good necessarily at turning in the paper because in the daytime, I'm trying to change the material conditions of the people that I love so much. But when I get the opportunity to be in session, it is such a gift. It's always been a gift. When I was in high school at George Washington High School, EAG, LES, the Eagles, Ooh, the <laughs> from freshman year to senior year, I had the blessing of being under the tutelage of Stanford Chandler. And he was our speech coach. And while I was going through Helen Back in my family, Helen Back spent most of my nights literally out here in Excelsior and filled all with friends wasn't at home a lot, was on juvenile probation. No matter what happened, I barely got a 2.0 from freshman year you know, to senior year. If you go in right now, I'm in the Hall of Fame in, in Washington, but it says I graduated in 96. I really graduated in 95, but I didn't really have the credit, so I had to go to summer school. So long story. <laughs> <laughs> but every Saturday, you better believe I was on that bus to that speech tournament, that debate tournament. I did mock Congress. I did extemporary speaking. I didn't think about this debate. I did extemporary speaking. And what that process taught me, and it wasn't what Michael James, who many of you all know, who's a popular educator from the film, or Black and Japanese Brother, who was my sensei, my, my theoretical political education teacher at the Center for Young Women's Development and Women's Freedom Center. What he taught us that, you know, the kids in the fields of Brazil, mostly Black children, weren't allowed to go to school. But there were teachers who taught them, again, a pedagogy of hope, a pedagogy of promise, that they could learn anything, and that learning did not have to happen in the classroom. That if they created modalities where they promised themselves that they would be teachers and learners, that they would learn individual skills and they would co-teach, I learned that way. When I finally, finally got to undergrad, finally, I went to Mills College, I am a cyclone and a Don, it took me 12 years to get through undergrad. I was a single mom. I was building reentry programs for now our Vice President Kamala Harris. And every single day, working with girls and working with folks in the streets, that was my school. That was my school. Tindanoy was my graduate and doctorate program. Literally understanding like, the behavioral science, the depths and the, 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 the lies that were taught about poverty and meritocracy. Now, coming back to grad school, why I am there, and it's so hard. It's hard. The qualitative and the quantitative, understanding how to be in the academy after running public systems and nonprofits. Why I am there, one, because I will run a city or a jurisdiction. That's right. And I really deeply want to understand, I want to understand how the sausage is made, mm -hmm. that politics, and yelling and screaming about our politic is not enough. Folks like Hydra and some of you all who are in this room, Shaman knows you can believe all you want 
And at the end of the day, someone has to create. To create the systems that free our people. And that's why I'm not sure. And it was hard. And I was a D and F student. But what I wish, and then I'll hand it, if every black and brown and poor child in this city knew that they were going to college, it, like we talk about guaranteed income, we're talking about guaranteed liberation, because what little arts gives you is a liberatory framework to understand who you are in the context of your conditions and your brethren and sisters. If they knew that and their parents knew that from birth, not just that you would be paid for, but in this city, there are 13 colleges and universities within 10 square miles that every child would have the opportunity to go to college. I wonder, would I have been in trouble? Would I, would I have been boosted from the trees? Y'all remember the trees? Yeah. <laughs> so I'll, end it, I'll end it there, but at 44, Dr. Riggs, in the MPA program who leaves it at USF convinced me that while I might be not be a perfect student, that I had an obligation to be in school so that I could run public systems to not only the best of my ability, but run them to make sure and ensure that the people that I was working for got the due diligence that they deserved. So you can be an F student. All that meant, all that meant is that services and structures that were supposed to surround me didn't hold my genius. And all of our babies have that. Woo! So, so much to unpack in that space, right? <laughs> and as I think about it, the other thing that I would say as we go to Roberto. I, I think I drunk his wine. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's mine. <laughs> <laughs> but something you said made me think about not just about what you learn or the obligation for you to be there, but your presence there, right? And I would say that for each one of you, there's a, you know, and, and for me, I feel like a lot of times just being the person in the room with the different perspective is educational for the other students, right? So that's not just about what you gain, but what you give. Because what's in those books and what's being taught is from a perspective that's different than yours. And so when you think about that, you know, I, I would say that you were a gift to whatever classroom you were in, right? The, the ability for you to come in with your lived experience, with your perspective, with your, with your life in that space transforms the space by your, by your very presence. So, you know, we'd love to know about your born and raised experience in terms of education here in San Francisco. Buenas noches. <laughs> it's an honor, doctora and colleagues to be here uh, on this amazing, and it, yeah, uh, it's a blessing. So thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity this evening to be with all of you. I, uh, you know, my, my experience as a Latino was a little bit different because I had, you know, my parents came from Latin America. And as a child, I remember being told consistently you know, we made this sacrifice to come to this country so you could become a lawyer and a doctor and all my God, the pressure it was on before I was even born. You know? And, uh, you know, I went to, uh, I started off at Bryant School and at Bryant School, you know, um, I grew up in a time when either you were black or you were white. Latinos did not exist. In fact, my birth certificate said this, I'm white. And one of the things in school at the time was that you could not speak Spanish. We were forbidden to speak Spanish, but yet, even though I was born here, the first language I learned and the only language I knew was Spanish. And so in kindergarten, believe me when I say, I got suspended from school for speaking Spanish, got sent to the principal office, I can't remember how many times. And so I, I started with a very negative experience, you know, in, in school. And as you can imagine, it, it, that, that language barrier and that conflict that the school created between uh, me, me, my mind, me, papa, and the school was just, it, it was horrible. And so uh, academically, I was not an achiever and I got behind, you know, we're just talking about that. 
you know, uh, the, our president of our, uh, our board, the supervisors, and, and I just got behind behind to the point where I hated school. And I became very angry and I became very resentful, you know, and 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 so by, by the age of 12, my papa, who was involved in the community, and may he rest in peace, um, sent me to Delano, California to go on to for Cesar Chavez and the Lord of Suerte. Now, I had no idea. I mean, I knew about Cesar, but I didn't know, you know, I, that, that would, you know. And I was angry because here I'm going to Delano, California to go spend my summer with a sleeping bag, sleeping on the floor in an old church hall. And let me tell you, that, those three months was the turning and change into my life because we, there was no TV. There was a little radio box and they were reading every night books. And, uh, and you get, you read a chapter, you know, and then you talk about what was in the chapter of the book. And when they, the first time they passed me the book to read, I was so fearful and I, I almost broke out in tears. And I said, I don't know how to read. You know, and that summer they taught me how to read. They taught me new words. They taught me about the importance of education. And when I left that summer, I, I gave uh, Cesar and Dolores a hug, and, and I said, "I'm brown and I'm proud because I wasn't proud to be brown." You know, and that was like for me. Uh, as I grew older, I realized they fed my heart, my soul, my spirit, and my mind. You know, and told me about the importance of education, but I was still behind school. You know, and 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 I did. I tried it as much as I could, but that I became a revolutionary. I, I, I figured that was my calling in life, and I finally had the nerve to tell my me, my mind, especially my father was fine with it. I told him, I'm not going to be a doctor, and I'm not going to be a lawyer. I said, I'm a revolutionary. I said, and you're with it, you ain't with me. You know, but my dad's with me, so <laughs> that was it. And that's what I did. I became a revolutionary, you know what I'm saying? And I, and I got involved with the City of La Raza. I got involved with Crown Parades. I got involved with RAP, the Royal Terms Program. And, and of course, United Farm Workers. And to this day, I'm still wanting to United Farm Workers. And then, you know, when, when you know, in high school, you know, it, it was it was one of these things in high school is that, like, if you just, like, make it through just to, you know, be promoted to the next grade to get to the next grade and they're just passing. And, and it's criminal when you think about it, you know, how they just uh, promote us from grade to grade and they give us a diploma. That is, that is, you know, criminal to me, you know? And so here I am, you know, and I was told to go to college and honestly, you know, I, I applied to go, go to college to make my mother happy. And I think that's the other thing that, that, that us as children, and I'm speaking about Latino children, you know, we do, we're, we're, we're the uh, children pleasers to our parents and we're doing things to please them versus us doing what we want to do because we believe in it or because we want to do it. So here I go apply to all these colleges. I get accepted to USF, right? I mean, like, wow, I was, that, that was crazy, right? You know, and it's like, I, and so here I go to, to, to USF because I, I got to a couple other colleges and uh, I got a little scholarship money. I go buy me a sweatshirt and a hoodie. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then I went about the books. <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, and I didn't know what classes to pick. So I just picked, you know, uh, I picked the uh, 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 studies. I, I picked the sociology class and, and a few others. And, and uh, um, I couldn't read. I could not read. I remember going, you know, the books were pretty thick back then, you know, and, and, and every other word. And and uh, so about six weeks in the first semester, uh, I was ready. I was ready to quit. I was done. You know, I was like, I waste my time. I figured I'm doing more good in the community than, just, you know, waste taking space here. And it just so happened that um, the day that I decided to quit, uh, and I got an honor in uh, uh, Don Ortiz, who was a professor at the time that he was at, and he was teaching my lesson studies, and he was one of my professors, and, and I ran into him. He said, I think the universe always puts you in place, you know? And, and so he says, how's it going? I said, I'm quitting. Today's my last day. He says, oh, no. Oh, no. He says, you talk about community, and you're out preaching education to kids, and you're going to quit? Oh, hell no. He took me to his office, and because he's my old guy, I don't respect him, you know, I was in Santa's office. 
He came back and he re-enrolled me in four ESL classes. And I said, I was born here, brother. Why, why are you doing me in an ESL class? You know? I said, I know English. I know English better than I know Spanish, you know? And, uh, and, and that's the other thing, as Latinos, you know what, it's, we, we never mastered the Spanish language or call pochos and Latinos who are Spanish speaking make fun of us because we don't know Spanish right. And then we don't know English right, so we get made fun of by people who, you know, correct us on our English. And he says, so you never mastered the Spanish or the English. He goes, you're going to go to these classes because you're going to learn to master Spanish, I mean English. I had to take a deep breath at that moment. I'm just like, okay, let's get back in here. And so I did. I went to class, and it was great. Nobody knew English. <laughs> there were from Japan, from Brazil, from Italy, you know. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I became a tutor. <laughs> like, yeah, straight A, straight A, 4.0. Never got a 4.0, right? And and then you know it was like the the after that whole little experience. So I read read the next semester I took ESL again. <laughs> I made a four point oh seven. I showed my mother, look, I got a four point oh. I didn't show her what classes it was. <laughs> I just showed her the four point oh. Right. And then uh, the the next thing you know is like I got I met this professor who was the you know, and I met him purposely because they found out about you know faculty. Was really good at the university, and they connected me with the ghostwriter for Martin Luther King, this white little short guy. And he took me in, he says, I'm gonna teach you how to write. And so the first paper I turned in, it came back all red, and I said, Did you cut your hand or something? I said, This is a lot of stains here. He said, No. He said, You're gonna rewrite that paper, and you're gonna rewrite it and rewrite it until you learn how to write, 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 and read, 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 and read, 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 read. But I dropped out, you know, after two years because uh, I, it was just too much pressure for me, you know, trying to do the community work. And I, I really felt my heart that it was more important to do the community work than to be in school. I, I went back, you know, the, they brought me back the second time. I dropped out again and came back the third time. I finally graduated when I was 39 years old. Woo, woo. Yeah. Hey, uh, I don't know, there's like three things that, that hit me as you all were speaking that you know, as we go back and we have this conversation about culture or lived experience or like the extra learning. First, when you said about kindergarten, so when I started kindergarten, the first day I went back home and I told my mom, and again, I think this has to do with um, the racial tensions or, you know, I was a product of busing in, in Berkeley, and I went home and I told my mom, the teacher said you spelled my name wrong because you spelled it with an S and she said it's supposed to be a C. My mom was like, you tell me how to spell the name and I, so we got to this big thing. But that idea of school, the teacher thinking that they would tell you, you know, like that idea of like your worth and your value. The other piece around, I just want to say too, like maybe it's people pleasing or pleasing parents there. I would say in my culture, it's fear. Right, like if I didn't get those grades or if I didn't do whatever, I knew that uh, I, I I flunked out my first year of college and I was like, I have got to go to summer school because if I go home, my mom is going to kill me, right? So I went back and I got like straight A's for the summer to bring my GPA up so I didn't get put out of, uh, and she was like, what is up with your, so it wasn't that I wanted to please her, I just didn't want her to hurt me. <laughs> that's, back when, that's back when people could physically abuse their kids and, and not be quite as worried about CPS. And then, um, but I think more than anything, it's the culture, right? The cultural pieces, like the fact that you, you went to Delano and like learning, right? That piece of like embedding and, and, and I think to me, Derek, that goes back to like, what pushed you to go to college? Like, share that story about like what it wasn't because you know you you know no. you were you were already crushing yeah. it. You didn't need to <laughs> yeah. you know. But but what pushed you back? Thank you, Dr. Davis. Yeah, and, and I'm loving this panel so far. Yeah. I'm sitting up here all night. Uh, let's give me a hand, everybody. And, um, it's interesting, uh, like you touched on. You know, finished high school. I started working at Boys and Girls Club. Working there for several years and loving the work that I was doing. Um, but I remember after about six years or so of doing that, um, you know, I, I love to be there. So I created 
this college prep program. And the goal for me was to bring college students in to inspire the young people to go to college. So after day one of that program, I remember like it was yesterday. The young people looked at me, it was like, D, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why should I go to school if you never did? And I'm like, damn, the truth hurts. And, and kids, you know, they could be truthful and honest. And, and I said, you know what? At the same time, you know, I had a daughter that was three months old. And I was like, you know what? Let me just, let me just take a day off of work and go to school and, and go to City College and just enroll and just, and just see what happens. So I, I went and surprised myself. I, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was trying to figure it out, trying to navigate it. Got connected with a counselor. Uh, talking about the class I needed to take. And, and when, I, when I got there, it wasn't necessarily about me anymore. It was about you know, my daughters. It was about my family. It was about the young people that I was working with at Boys and Girls Club. And I began to just to get it. You know, it began to flow. Yes, I had to work hard, bust my butt, work full time, go to school full time, but I did it. And I remember every time I got my report card, I would run to the Boys and Girls Club, show the young people that I worked with, to show them my GPA, and we would have competitions to see who could get the highest GPA. You guys know who won every semester. <laughs> uh, but it was inspired. Yeah, I crushed it. You know that. But it was good because I started to inspire them, and then they began to work hard, and their grades began to go up, and we began to you know, really inspire each other. So. For me, like I said, I really didn't have a plan to go. It kind of just happened and went that way. But I went to work for the Boys and Girls Club so to inspire the young people. But in turn, they inspired me to go to college and change my life for the best. Your daughter had a different experience, right? And so that idea of inspiring or young people, like how, how did you create that path? So Amina went to the Boys and Girls Club two blocks away. Back then it was $5 a year. <laughs> I was running the Young Women's Freedom Center and I was late every day, wherever Ivan is, sorry. Um, every day, um, and he'd be sitting there, Amina would be sitting there. I was that single mom who uh, was working and going to City College. I went to City College for seven years. I could have had a PhD. <laughs> and I know there's some people who had that experience, right? We just yeah. go and then you take like criminal justice, right? You can take like business, business English. And I just, I never figured out how to matriculate through until I, I, I got the opportunity to go to Mills College. And only one college course transferred over. So I started off as a grown ass woman with one college credit. And I had to do, it was well, supposed to be four years, which is to be 12. Amina saw me in school and she oftentimes was sitting to the right or the left side of the chair of wherever I was. Um, and when we had a one bedroom BMR south of market after we moved from the Bannockers, um, my light was always on. And I am a helicopter mom and I am, I believe so deeply that all of the folks that I grew up with, many of you, you know, a lot of black folks, didn't go to college that I did. A lot stayed home and, and couldn't do that and are deeply struggling and are now in their 40s with Tinderbor. It's a black neighborhood. People forget that. Yeah. But I so wanted to be able to be free. I wanted to get her in every single program I wanted. She is 25 now in her second year of law school at Howard Law. And I'm a seven-year-old, right? And she was like, I don't even know. <laughs> I have the, but you know what? She was hired by you at Ella Hill. No nepotism. We weren't even close then. <laughs> she, she was hired by Cheryl she worked with the young people. She interned, you know, for Mayor Lemon Bree's office. She worked at the community center around all of these women. And I and I believe that, that LB, Mayor London Green, was in the MPA program that I'm in right now when she was interning for her. So all throughout her young adult life, she was around these women. who I was currently in school on and off, one class per semester, but she was around these folks who she knew white knuckled their way. One of the things that I think that is extremely important about looking at working class and middle class kids of color who get to do this school thing, these are the same children. My daughter is 25. 
She is a child, right? A child. She's in law school, but she is a child. At A50 Bryant right now, we have children behind bars for nonviolent crimes. Children. And so this, this, this wonderment that I see Amina experiencing, being at Howard, I had two Black teachers K through 12. Two, total. In public school, I went to Clayton Lillianthal, I went to Presidio, and I went to Washington High School. Can you imagine, as a Black or brown child, being in a situation where excellence was mirrored to you every day by someone who looked like you? One of the things that she said is going through school here, she internalized, even with all of the brilliant people around her, were that white women were smarter. And this is a brilliant young woman. Because as she's unpacking what she learned in historically white run institutions, now being at a black institution, it came clear to her that being at an HBCU was the most radical thing that she could have done for herself. I'm so happy, Cheryl, that our little baby who belongs to so many of us, because you all helped me raise her, will come back and she's gonna be a public defender. She's interning next summer, her second year at the because so many of us need a second, third, and fourth chance, as I had, as I had, as we did. So it's a totally different situation. She's not working. She got a meal card. <laughs> She's not living in a dorm. Her mother's paying half her apartment. I mean, it's a very different situation. Many of our young people at San Francisco State and even USF, you know, they're working there right now in cafeterias serving wealthy kids cheesecake. So education isn't free, nor is it equitable. But I got to say, all of us are Dons. Being at a Jesuit university, this is the last thing I'm going to say on this panel. The day when that brother, my brother who's a police officer, was convicted of killing my brother. We saw it all over the news. There was a call in at USF where our president asked all the students and faculty to call in. And there was one of the priests, one of the fathers, the African man, he gave a prayer to Chauvin, that was his name, right? About let us not be the people who we despise. Mm -hmm. And as we think about public service, as we think about educating our children, it was, I was so happy. I was like, I'm in a, a good place to even be able to pray for the people that we hate to renew our understanding in our own pedagogy, in our own educational process, that as we're trying to be public servants of good, that we create opportunities that are humane for the folks who have acted out and who have forgotten about their own humanity. And isn't that what education is for? So yeah, my paper will be two weeks late. But, <laughs> When people say, and Shaman, you've heard this because you've worked with young people too. The folks are like, you don't need to go to school. Those are typically the people who went to school who say that to our children. Everybody deserves the right to a liberal arts education. Can you get on a couple of things that I think for me were going to look like, again, back to being able to see yourself, being able to value yourself, and talk a little bit about this earlier. In terms of this next generation, whether it's your own children or children in the community, when you talk about going into a space and learning and being able to, you talk about Nina being able to see folks. I I don't remember having black teachers, um, but I do remember church. I do remember Black History Month in the church where I had to learn a lot of poems. I had to learn to get in front of the crowd and speak and better not mess up because my mom's eyes were right there locking with me. Do not miss this word. But that moment of like, even right now today, I don't remember the whole poem, but I can go back to pretty women wonder where my secret lies. See, I'm not cute to build to see the fashion on all sides. But when I try to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. In those moments when I didn't see myself, or didn't feel pretty, or I didn't feel like I belonged, I can go back to Maya Angelou and say, phenomenal woman, right? And so those spaces and being able to see each other and being able to be encouraged, and I think you represent that. That's why I take pleasure in like mayor of the mission, right? Like for folks to be like, oh, he's running things. He's looking out for folks. Even all these years later, you are still representing. And so in that space, in this place, like, how do you encourage young people that are like, what's next? 
How am I moving forward? I, I got to go back just for a moment because you hit a nerve. I, I remember a teacher of Grandma Hannah and Dave was close. What, what is your dad doing? I mean, what is that mechanic? And he goes, You got great mechanic hands. And, you know, yeah. and I was in the great, you know. And so there was never, you know, that instilling in us to to do great. You know, I had the honor of meeting the one of the great, uh, no, the grand a grandchild of Walt Disney, uh, African American brother, took me to go have lunch with him somewhere to 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 meet him. And so one of the questions I asked, I said, "So how was it happening?" You know, Walt Disney, you know. And, he said, oh, he used to take us to church every Sunday. And after church, we'd go have brunch. And before we would, you know, eat, he would have us go around and introduce each our, ourselves and say, my name is so-and-so, and I'm going to go to college, and I'm going to become a millionaire. And this was at the age of five, right? You know, so when you look at that, and then you look at the environment that we're growing, I mean, here in the Mission District, we have the most amount of liquor stores in any other neighborhood in San Francisco, right? That sell Mad Dog 2020, River Wine. I don't, I, you know what I'm saying? We all drank that stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so when you look at the, the drugs, right? So when you look at alcohol and drugs and drug dealers and on and on, and you know, the rest, right? I mean, it's like as a child, you're growing up, and, and that's part of like what you see and what you grow up with, and you see people with money. You know, and so for me, it was like, that was tempting, you know, and, and I, I, I became a functioning drug addict and alcoholic. You know, I got 25 years sober and clean now, you know. My healing, you know, that here I was doing good work in the community. I went to USF, but yet that the, those demons and that, that wolf, that devil inside of me, and all that hate and anger that I grew up with because of the racism that I grew up with, you know, I'm lucky I'm alive, honestly. It's a blessing, you know, because I, I, I put myself at risk. I put myself in situations I should have never been in, you know, and, and I got people that I grew up with, like you're talking, dead, we had a buried, in prison that I go visit, you know what I'm saying? And so young people today, you know, I, I, I really ain't, I tell them the truth. I tell them the truth. Everything that I did, that I did. And I say, you know what? So it, it's, it, we have choices and we have the power of, of planning our future. And that's what our children don't learn. They don't learn to plan five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. And that's what I tell them. I said, you know, and I have, in fact, I was just with one yesterday. He just bought a house. Oh, my God, I almost cried. He came to see me and told me, you know what? He, uh, thank you for helping me get my GED. Help me go to college. Help me get my job. He says, I just want to know, I bought that house because he planted that seed. And, of course, he didn't buy it. Out just but we bought it out of the city. Right? <laughs> but just the fact that, in your fact, that he bought, you know, in San Francisco, you know, and said so that that's for me is like uh, uh, what I it really look at is like you know that street corner you don't own that corner because if you own that corner the police will not be coming and arrest you the police will not be telling you to get off that corner you don't own that corner get off that you know because I think that's the other thing is this this you know we 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 have this like we grow up you know like and I grew up in a corner. You know, yeah, I was one that yeah, is my honor. You know, running back in the yard, you know, you go bragging at go on, you know, two two, you know, and all that. <laughs> shit. You know, it's like, it's but it is is that you know, it's for me. I think it's it's how do we uh, how do we as individuals really um, open up and be honest about our own past? You know, like yeah, you know, it's to say yeah, it was bad now, but yeah. So as we kind of wind down and wrap up, I think the thing that I've really been wrestling with is when I was growing up, it was supposed to be like, you do this, then you go to college, then you do the next thing. And I think there's now starting to be more conversation around like, there's nothing wrong with going to junior college. Yeah. There's nothing yeah. wrong with taking a gap year. Yeah. 
right? Like how are we normalizing and talking about lessons learned or how we move forward? And I, I would just ask you all, because you all live and breathe in it. I know you're at USF now and you're seeing students come in at different spaces and places. You're funding educational pathways and opportunities. And you're you're doing this work in the community. You're seeing what's happening at the mission hub. You know who's looking for jobs and what those skill sets are. You know, as we just kind of wrap up whatever order you all want to go in, like, what does this look like? How do we change the mindset that says you got to be a straight A student, you got to go to four year university, then you got to do all these other things um, to what end, right? So, you know, one of the, when I was at Mills, I, two things I've learned from college is check the syllabus like 80 times and then also reach our email. And when I, one day, opened up my email as a sophomore, after completing seven years of student college, but whatever. There's an email and it said, if anybody wants to go to China, just submit one page. And I spent three weeks in China and it was fully paid. I was like, this is what they think he's seen. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that very similar to philanthropy, right? I'm in philanthropy now. Let's keep secrets. What if children understood what they could experience? You can take the classes that you want. I'm on the board of the CSU yes. system, which is the largest public university system in the world, 23 universities. If you go and you are low income, your full tuition will be paid for by Pell. It, like, it's free. Yeah. Yeah. You will take some loans if you want to kick it, you know, if you, can, if you want to actually have your own bed, but you can get that education and not be harbored deep in debt. There are ways. What if we actually told every single young person out here to travel the world almost for free? We have to dispel what education feels and looks like. We are so traumatized as young people of color going to public schools in cities like San Francisco, where we walk in and immediately are problematized and pathologized for not only what we look like, where we come from, but many of those teachers taught our parents and hate and remember them, right? If you, you know this is true. You are in school and you are hated from the day you come in. You are disrespected and you are not celebrated. You are merely tolerated. And I went through K through 12 here and that was my experience. It was special people who reminded me and others like me that we were to be celebrated. What if we reimagined what college looked like? I am very clear that college is for everyone. You can learn a vocation or you can learn philosophy, but being in a situation where everyone is committed to their own self-determination and liberation through the studies of others is so important. I'm reading right now about the innovations in Milan. And instead of just talking crap of what should be and what has been, I have a whole year to learn about how urban planners across the world are innovating transit, public health, dealing with the COVID crisis. So my politic won't be an analogy. It will be based on peer-reviewed articles. Why we and how we gain political power is understanding the world. So our political education has to be about mastery instead yeah. of just survival. Yeah. USF has a larger black population per percentage than San Francisco State. I would yeah. drop my mic right now. Mm. <laughs> okay, you drop your mic, I'm gonna pick mine now too. And, and, and it does, definitely. We're, we're doing amazing work in USF. Yes, definitely about 15 well, I, I did go to USF and San Francisco State, so I love them both the okay, same. Okay, 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 okay. Um, about the dimes, um, but but thank you. But one of the things that, that I, I focus on as well is just leading by example, and I think you know showing the young people the way. Um, and one of the things that I feel that the, the best path to education is just the path you take. Uh, there, there's not a set written rule. You know, finish high school, go straight to college, or you do this, you go. It's just whatever feels right. But I think one of the things that I instilled in my kids, I have two beautiful daughters. Layla and Dariana. And for me, growing up, like college was not on my radar, but for them, they already knew because my wife and I, Tracy, we instilled in them at an early age. So when they got, you know, out of high school, they were like, okay, which, high, which, which college am I going to? Um, and my oldest went to the University of Oregon. 
And uh, my youngest, Dariana, she attends USF. So she's a first year student now, doing her things, living her life on the dorms, excited about that. But like, we're, we're starting a new trend. Like we're starting a new trend. It's okay to go to school. And like another thing for me, when I was young, it wasn't cool to be smart, like at all. So I knew I was smart, I was doing my thing, but it wasn't cool to be smart. You don't want to be square or anything like that. So I was cool and I was tough and I was doing my thing. But later on in life, when I had the opportunity to go to school, because I was inspired by the young people that I worked with, um, I was able to change the game, lead by example. And currently, like I say, I'm, I'm right now uh, leading the way at the Leo T. McCarthy Center and um, you know, there at USF. And I'm intentional about reaching out to young people throughout the city, inviting them on campus on a regular basis. Uh, creating mentorship programs to make sure they engage with USF. And just even case the point, as I touched on, I grew up in the Western Edition, I would go up and down the 5, 4, 10, uh, you know, 31 golf ball, and USF was not on my radar at all. Like, I just, I, I knew, I saw it was a church up there on a the hill or something like that, but I really didn't know. But that's why now I'm really being intentional and in working with uh, community-based organizations throughout the city working on programs with them and inviting the young people, like I said, I'm saying it again, being intentional about that and connecting with the young people. But I'll stop here, but really just leading by example. And one of the things I want to say is seeing is believing. Believing, we just have to show them. Okay. I always believe when I go somewhere like tonight, you gotta leave with them with something to do. So how about we leave tonight with, let me throw this at you, my brother is that USF start a program where we start taking first graders on a field trip to USF, second graders, third graders, fourth graders, fifth graders. Imagine that. And then they went to San Francisco State the following year. And then they went to City College the following year. And then they went to Hastings Law College another year. Then they went to UCSF and on and on and on. You know, then, you know what, we'll be free and it's free. Don't cost them, right? We go to the zoo, right? When we're kids, right? What do we learn from going to the zoo, right? <laughs> so can you imagine that? I, I think that, that I would propose that, you know, tonight we all collectively, you know, help you, you know, start, you know, taking children, you know, first grader on all the way in the unified school district because they need help right now. Anyway, so we can, you know, be the school district and help give them a little help right now. By, by putting, you know, uh, and, 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 and really, because that's, I think that, that, that just being in the campus, again, it's planting the seeds, yes. Yes. you know, yes. and, 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 and we don't, it's, it's like, we go to the zoo, yes. you know? Well, well, to yeah. piggyback on, uh, <laughs> piggyback on, on what everyone has said here, the seeing is believing and the intentionality, Latifa talked about peer review and all that, I taught for over a decade in private school. And so this idea of planting the seed and folks seeing it from kindergarten, they're talking about college, right? It's embedded, it's a part of the conversation. It's part of the expectation. You know, we talk about um, the career days, right? Career days are a real thing from kindergarten, being exposed to things that we don't even understand that when we're talking about being basketball players, they're meeting the marketing manager of the basketball team. They are meeting the owners and that kind of seed planting and going to, um, and just to wrap it up and, and build on again, I've often said what I realized, I, I never really got fully into like college sports. And I know, you know, we got our our diehard sports fans, and I'm not going to talk about the 49ers or the Warriors up in here tonight. But that what I noticed is that folks who were really into their alma maters and they talked about sports and they get up and on Saturday and Sunday they're watching the college sports games and they're buying their infants jerseys and hats, they're introduced to college from birth. That expectation, that experience, that exposure from birth. They know what college is. They don't have to be introduced to it. So I really do think we need to build on the seed that Roberto has planted about how are we talking about, and to your point about the secrets, right? The secrets of college in and of itself, to be in that space and to believe that you belong there. Yes. Yeah. 
That's the other piece of that. How are we saying that you belong here? Not that you have to waylay or go a different path. It is what you decide. And if you decide that you want to go, then we need to make sure that we go there. So I, I want to say, even though it doesn't cost anything, I just do want to recognize Mayor Breed and President Walton who have been allocating and putting money out there to make sure wants an education and wants to go to college gets that and then we're going to follow up with um csu over here to get something because i need to go back so i can take a trip somewhere for three months <laughs> <laughs> but thank you all so so much precious are you going to close this out precious is wearing usm colors so <laughs> <laughs> okay um I have been here now for two months and in this role. And can I just say, one of the reasons I love this particular space is because of events like this. Y'all took me back home, especially talking about church. And as soon as you started talking, I was like, that was Mrs. Davenport. <laughs> and I'm a woman, and I'm having like, PTSD, but it's all good. <laughs> but Thank you all so much for sharing your time, sharing, man, I'm so sorry, I feel like I'm blocking you in the room. Um, sharing your wisdom and inspiring all of us. I'm sure, if, can we just actually give them another round of applause? Thank both here in person and on Zoom for participating in this important conversation. I know we all have some jewels, some nuggets that we're gonna take back with us and spread that word. The idea of having first graders, second graders, how powerful would that be? That is transformation right there. And so this is awesome. And we are just really excited and I wanted to just take a second to tell you all a little bit about the space that you're in. We usually have a tradition where we ask who's here for the first time and just know your neighbor, but we wanted to dive right into this rich conversation. But basically, this space here is a community space. We are the place where San Francisco, I should say, our mission is to be the place where San Francisco comes to be engaged, to learn, and to activate in its civic, political, and cultural life. We are a space for everyone. And so you have a range of events here at Manny's, anywhere from the governor kicking off the say no to the recall vote to tonight's conversation. We had an amazing conversation with our board of supervisors president recently. We do it all here. And in the coming days, tomorrow we are hosting what we call San Francisco's next big idea, where we are inviting the community to come. Sky's the limit, it doesn't matter. It can sound ridiculous, but we are building the city together and we are wanna create that space where you can share those ideas. Next week, we're partaking in the national conversation. You all may know all the craziness going on on Facebook right now. So, ooh. <laughs> the two authors of the book, The Ugly Truth, that really deconstructs the hot mess that is Facebook and their quest for dominance are going to be joining us. I should say one of the two will be joining us next Tuesday. So definitely you don't want to miss that. And then we also have a San Francisco icon, Juanita Moore, coming. She doesn't do a lot of interviews, so we're very excited about that. Um, I don't do sports either, but I do drag race. And drag. So I was like, okay, I feel that. So we are really excited about that. And we hope that you all will come back, tell your friends, tell your community, and join us. And if you also agree with what we're doing and you're as excited about our work as I am, I encourage you, one, to go to welcometomanies.com so you can get on our subscription list and get our weekly update as to what we're doing. And if you are able, consider becoming a Manny sponsor. We're really modern now. We got QR codes up on the screens. But basically, that is how this work happens. We have a dedicated base of sponsors who contributed uh, $36 a month to ensure that this programming continues, that we're able to make the space available for important conversations like this, free of charge, and that we can be a space of innovation for the city. So again, Sponsorship is right there. Subscribe to our newsletter at welcometomanies.com. 
Thank you all. Y'all are amazing. I am like so buzzed from just hearing this. The church thing, you really got me. Well, I'm sorry, I'm tripping. <laughs> 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 but thank you all so much. Have a wonderful evening.